Next, we visit with Dr. William G. Weirda, who is head of the CLL section and executive medical director of leukemia at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Hi, Dr. Weirda, we're so happy to have you here today. Good afternoon, happy Great. to be here. Yes, good afternoon. So, we have heard about a number of trials being presented in CLL at this year's ASH meeting. So let's first talk a little bit about um, ibrutinib uh, versus FCR in untreated younger patients. Why is this study important? So there are three large randomized trials that are very important uh, that are being presented at ASH uh, this year. The first of which is the trial that you're referring to, which was a trial that evaluated ibrutinib plus rituximab versus FCR for previously untreated patients who were fit enough to receive FCR-based therapy. Half the patients were assigned to ibrutinib plus rituximab, half to FCR, and that trial showed an improvement in progression-free survival, uh, favoring those patients who received ibrutinib plus rituximab, and also an overall survival, um, favoring those patients who received ibrutinib-based therapy. So that, that is a notable feature because that's, of the three large randomized trials, that is the only trial that's showing ibrutinib uh, being associated with improvement in overall survival. We were expecting it to be a positive trial with regard to progression-free survival. We need to hear the data and the details about the deaths that occurred on the FCR arm to have a better idea about why they are seeing an improvement in overall survival. Um, however, it's a very significant and notable um, trial. The other notable feature about that trial is there was an improvement in progression-free survival, particularly in patients who have a, uh, an unmutated immunoglobulin gene. So, that progression-free survival difference was statistically significant. In contrast to patients who have a mutated immunoglobulin gene, there was not a significant difference in outcomes for those patients. So we, we've reported data and others, um, large, other large uh, trials have reported data in terms of a plateau for patients who have a mutated V gene, potential cure fraction with that population. So for me, we're still considering FCR an important treatment for patients who have a mutated V-gene. For the patients who have an unmutated V-gene, based on this trial, my impression is that, and my opinion is that ibrutinib is the standard of care. There are two other large randomized trials. Um, one is a trial that's done by the Alliance that was presented as a plenary uh, presentation. That was a three-arm trial. Patients were assigned to treatment with ibrutinib monotherapy or ibrutinib plus rituximab or bendamustine plus rituximab, another chemoimmunotherapy regimen. Bendamustine rituximab is important because it's tolerated by um, younger patients relatively well, but also older patients. So it's a little bit more intensive um, chemoimmunotherapy regimen than chlorambucil-based treatment, less intensive than FCR. And that three-arm randomized trial showed improvement in progression-free survival for the, both of the ibrutinib-based arm, monotherapy and with rituximab. There was no difference in terms of overall survival, and there was no difference in terms of progression-free survival between the two ibrutinib arms. So there's still discussion, and the data does not necessarily indicate improvement in outcomes with the addition of a CD20 antibody to ibrutinib-based therapy if you're giving continuous indefinite treatment uh, with ibrutinib. All right, those are some great points there. Now, let's look at the prospective data from the Morano study looking at long-term outcomes of venetoclax plus rituximab in relapse refractory disease. So what are the findings here? So last year we heard uh, the data from the uh, Murano trial. This is a randomized trial of bendamustine rituximab versus venetoclax rituximab for previously treated patients. Last year the presentation um, reported improvement in progression-free survival and overall survival favoring venetoclax plus rituximab over bendamustine plus rituximab. The treatment with bendamustine rituximab is six cycles of chemotherapy and then patients stop. Venetoclax rituximab is a little bit longer treatment period, so patients can get up to two years of treatment with venetoclax, six cycles of the rituximab at the beginning of that treatment. But the question was whether, although there was a difference in progression-free survival, were those responses durable because most of the patients that were reported last year were still on treatment with venetoclax. This year we received follow-up for 130 patients who had discontinued the venetoclax. 
um, and that data shows a durable response and we're not seeing progressors rapid, patients rapidly progressing after they discontinue venetoclax. So this follow-up is very important um, with regard to that and there was also data presented um, in an oral session by Arnon Cotter who um, gave updates with regard to MRD and showing the fact that patients who achieve an undetectable MRD status after they stop treatment with venetoclax have a longer progression-free survival. And you yourself are you're leading an abstract on MRD status with venetoclax and CLL. So can you walk us through that study a little bit? Right. So that was an analysis of a combination of trials um, with venetoclax for relapsed and refractory patients. There were two trials that we included in that group. Um, one was for relapsed patients with 17p deletion, and the other was for patients who were refractory to ibrutinib or idelolicid. And that was a continuous treatment with venetoclax, monotherapy. So patients went on venetoclax and they continued um, until progression and, uh, and then was, they were discontinued at that point. That analysis shows that even with continuous monotherapy, depth of remission is important in terms of outcome. So with our landmark analysis, uh, we demonstrated that patients who achieved an MRD undetectable status um, in the blood had a longer progression-free survival with a landmark at 12 months as, all, as well as a landmark analysis at 24 months. So clearly this shows improvement in outcomes for patients who achieve a deep remission, even in patients on venetoclax who are on monotherapy and continuous therapy. Got it. It's very interesting. So now we're also learning about acquired resistance of venetoclax um, with the recurrent GLY101VAL mutation. So though this is also a late breaker, what are you looking forward to learning about this study? So this is a late breaker. We haven't seen the data yet. Um, there are patients who develop resistance to venetoclax, and we haven't had a great definitive um, answer in terms of what the mechanism for that is. People have looked at various things, upregulation of MCL1, upregulation of BCLXL. Well, this late-breaking abstract has looked at mutations in BCL2 and has correlated refractory disease to, to venetoclax with development of this particular mutation in a subgroup of patients who they evaluated. Great. Now, there's also been a lot of CAR T-cell therapy abstracts going on in CLL. So um, what does this really say about what potential role this type of therapy has? What, what kind of data have we seen that's exciting? Right, for CLL, the preliminary data that we were seeing with um, CAR T-cell therapy was um, somewhat limited and the responses were limited. So the complete remission rate with CAR T-cell therapy in CLL had been reported at about 20 to 30%. And so the question is, how can we bring those response rates up, the complete remission rate up, to where we are seeing with ALL and, um, and lymphomas? And so the abstracts that were presented at ASH here um, this year were strategies to enhance uh, the complete remission rate, things like adding ibrutinib to uh, the, CAR, the CAR T cell uh, therapy. And that appears to be increasing the, uh, the response rate. Definitely. So now looking overall at some of the other CLL abstracts being presented this year's ASH meeting, what are some others um, off the top of your head that you're really excited about this year? In terms of other strategies for CLL, I mean the big news has been these large randomized trials. Um, there are some other abstracts of newer agents um, that are being evaluated, um, but those are very preliminary uh, preliminary data. So I, I think really the big news from this apps, from this ASH is these large randomized trials and changing and shifting the standard of care for patients. We've presented data from MD Anderson uh, looking at uh, combinations of small molecule inhibitors. This was an update from an abstract that we presented last year. And that strategy, we're getting very deep remissions um, and we're very excited about that strategy. And I think it gives a promise of fixed duration treatment so it's treatment for a defined period, and a year perhaps, and then discontinuation of treatment and patients remaining in remission for long periods of time. The question is, when they relapse, how do we manage them when they relapse? Um, but clearly we're getting very deep remissions with these small molecule inhibitor combinations. Great. Well, Dr. Weirda, thank you so much for sitting down with us today and walking us through all these CLL abstracts, and have a great rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thanks.